I'll just start. Hi, Shelley. Hi. Hi. How are you, Sharon? Yeah, really well, thank you. So, um, just to just to kick us off, um, firstly, I would just like to do an acknowledgement of country for the um, the Indigenous um, uh, owners of the land. So, we are proudly we are proud to acknowledge the Jarrah people of the Jarjarrung as the traditional owners of the country that Hepburn Shire Council is located. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands where attendees and presenters of today's webinar are located. I'm not sure where how I would do that for you, Jane, in the US, but um, hopefully I've acknowledged the um, traditional owners of your land and we pay our respects to leaders and elders past, present and emerging. So for those that haven't met me as yet, um, Sharon Hebbard, the Artisan Ag Facility Specialist for Hepburn Shire Council. Um, I'm leading a three year project specifically designed between state government and local government to facilitate and support small scale and artisan producers in the region. One of the things that were highlighted in the business case and was around some of the barriers that, that affect small scale producers. Often they can be regulatory, um, lack of awareness of what people do and, and branding image, access to finance and understanding how to access grants to scale up, shared infrastructure and shared market channels. So that's one of the reasons that we're doing this sort of um, business support webinar today was to look at that as well as competing land use pressures, which often is, as land gets more expensive, how do farmers you know, maintain farming or new entrants to farming? So it's a really exciting project. And the, the end goal for, for me is a more independent, less constrained and more collaborative um, artisan ag sector. So today's fantastic webinar on farmers and foodies together and how communities are working together to build strong regional food distribution channels is um, hosted by the director of Open Food Networks, Jennifer Sheridan. Um, I've, I've met Jennifer now on a number of times over the last two to three months and um, the, the passion that Open Food Network have for making small, sure that small scale producers get access to market channels is a fantastic footprint. Um, she's brought along Renata Cumming today um, from Strathbogie Local, which is another small region for those that don't know, north of Melbourne. So. Um, um, I'm sure Renata will share a little bit about her insights. So Jen's going to probably give us an overview of, of what the, the next uh, hour looks like. So I'll hand over to you, Jen. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sharon. And just to make sure everyone's comfortable, just to let people know that we are recording, because obviously there are quite a lot of people who wanted to be able to come today. Um, so just being aware that as you're speaking, that this is recorded and will be going up on a private YouTube link to other people who were um, not able to make it today. So, in terms of what we're going to cover today, um, unfortunately, you'll sort of see the the uh, the vision with the a bit of context around it, because otherwise, I can't see your lovely faces while I'm presenting. If I have it on full presenter mode, um, we'll just ask you if you could mute when you're not talking. I've muted most people now, but just unmute yourself if you do want to um, have a chat at any point. But we're going to try and run through as much of the content as possible and then leave time for a sort of like bit of a bulkier discussion at the end. So a nice solid sort of 15, 20 minutes at the end to really talk about next steps and to ask any questions um, or kind of make any comments and proposals at that point. But just, but we would like to make use of the chat in the, um, on the Zoom. So probably lots of people familiar with it by now, but if you just want to jump into the chat now and add your your name, um, what sort of farming or food business or organisation or interest you have in this topic, um, you know, what you do where you, and where you're based and if you're in the Hepburn Shire and just have a read of who else is there as well. In terms of what Open Food Network do, um, very briefly, we basically are around helping sort of power a new food system. So we run an online open source platform that helps farmers sell direct and most importantly helps farmers aggregate to sell. Um, they, we also build tech solutions for other organisations. So for example, we build Serious Fair Foods um, software. And then we do a lot of work in this kind of space, like what we're doing today, where it's really around helping regional food economies thrive and food enterprises thrive. So things like shared learning days, we have a whole heap of resources on our website, which I'll point to later on. We do mentoring, um, we do sort of regional food economy development projects, um, food hub feasibility studies, all sorts of stuff. And then we also do some sector development around things like research and advocacy to make sure that government 
philanthropy, academia understand this space as well. In terms of what we'll cover today, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the critical success factors and some case studies of collaborative food distribution. So where farmers and foodies are working together. Um, we're going to talk, Renata Cumming from Strathbogie Local is going to talk us through the nuts and bolts of actually starting a collaborative food enterprise, um, Strathbogie Local. We're going to talk about starting something where you are and the resources to kind of help you take the next steps. And then hopefully some solid time for discussion around what's their appetite for in the Hepburn region, what could some of those next steps be? So we'll aim to have at least sort of 15, ideally 20 minutes on that at the end. And just sing out, um, you know, unmute yourself and jump in if anything's unclear as well. But we'll try and save the bulk of that kind of conversation and discussion for the end. And so what we're talking about today is farmers and foodies together and sort of starting new values-based collaborations. And this picks up from where we got to with the last Hepburn Shire webinar, um, which was all around, you know, how people are responding to, to COVID-19 and so on. But we were sort of talking at that webinar around forming new collaborations around shared values and just sort of making the point that different people form different enterprises for different reasons. Um, and so just being kind of aware of that as our starting point for discussion today. So thinking about what is it that makes you want to have farmers and foodies working together in your region? Is it, you know, the regional economy? Is it, you know, fair prices for farmers? Is it tourism? Is it bringing young people into the region and helping them have a scale of farm that they can start up. Um, there's all sorts of different kind of motivating factors. And so we'll talk through some of those different motivating factors as we go through uh, some of today's topics as well. And just some of the other values that people identified last time that we talked about were things like viability, equitable, equitable access to food, resilience of a region, um, and sort of sustainability, regenerative practices and facilitating some of those. So community food enterprises is really what we're talking about when we're talking about farmers and foodies working together. And what those, what food, community food enterprises are, are they are locally owned or locally controlled food businesses or ventures that are founded around a desire to create positive outcomes for the communities they serve. This may be in the form of improved social or environmental outcomes, increased access to healthy food and support of local producers by providing fair farm gate prices. And so it's really important to go from the start and say that these can be individual farmers, these can be private businesses, these can be not-for-profits, these can be community cooperatives, these can be kind of loose organisations, but we're sort of using that banner term of community food enterprises today to capture to encapture sort of all of those different types of food initiatives um, that have this as their core kind of driving reason and we believe that these are what underpins a better food system some of the things i'm talking through today are going to be from our report that we released last year which looked specifically at community food enterprises and their sort of role in change um, and some of the critical success factors that we'd identified from around a decade of working with these types of enterprises. So what were the five critical success factors for community food enterprises? Now building community, appropriate scale, managing for impact, understanding the levers for viability and collaboration. And we're going to go through each of those in a little bit more detail with an example um, of a community food enterprise sort of and, and what that means in practice. And I'll talk a little bit with each of them as well around perhaps some of the driving unifying goals that are underneath each food enterprise. So you can start to get a sense of the different ways that people set things up depending on what they're trying to achieve. So firstly, building community. This was the absolute critical success factor underpinning so many community food enterprises. And it's all about trusted relationships, but, and they were just absolutely essential. And those, those are trusted relationships between, you know, suppliers to the community food enterprise, between farmers and, you know, potentially a food hub or an enterprise. Definitely trusted relationships with customers and between, you know, farmers and customers, partners, sellers. It was really key 
And it was so important to build a values aligned community to make something like this happen. Um, and it was really important often for people to have like a long term commitment um, to, I guess, if not that enterprise, then at least building that values aligned community around food. And so one example is Beechworth Food Co-op up in the northeast of Victoria. Um, and I, I guess I want to pull out some of their values that underpinned what started them up and point to the journey that they had been on. So they started with, um, you know, Jade, Jade Miles kind of in the region thinking about farmer suicide in their region and the lack of return and the lack of a fair price that was going to farmers. It was really pushing people to the absolute brink um, and they wanted to do something to change some of the conditions that they saw were creating that mental health crisis in their region. And so they wanted to set up a fresh food market that got a fair price for farmers and, you know, got local food into the local region. But they recognised that they didn't really have a buying group large enough to service the kind of fresh produce output of the region. And so what they started was the Beechworth Food Co-op and they started with dry goods and they did that because it was shelf stable and they could build a values aligned community before they launched something fresh. And so they built up to a co-op of 800 members, which is huge in terms of the- Barbara, I'm, I'm trying to get you in. I'll, oh, thank you, I'll try and re, I'll re send you the link to see if I got um, in. I got sure. in. Okay. Just mute, um, Sharon there. Um, so if we look at theirs, um, it was really around yeah, building a community around those values. Sorry, I'm just going to ask if you're, if you're just joining, if you could mute as you're coming in, that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, so moving on to the second critical success factor was around appropriate scale. And that was both in terms of um, supply and demand. And so matching that scale through the supply network. Um, and so one example of what we mean by that was that so Bauble Food Hub down in the southeast of Victoria, um, and they really recognised the need to attract small to medium farmers to work with the kind of scale of buildings that they had and the scale of community that they were servicing and the kind of even just, you know, down to the, um, oh, like the feasibility, of, you know, like, are you talking about pallet loads of vegetables or are you talking about tubs of vegetables that fit into, you know, the back of someone's van? And so that was really important to kind of match, you know, your farmers who were happy to supply at the tubs of vegetables level when they still had that type of, um, that type of infrastructure set up, I guess. Uh, and so in terms of scale, then it's not just about that sort of matching of scale at that, starting point but also about how you kind of achieve scale through collaboration on that infrastructure marketing logistics rather than everyone trying to scale up in a kind of really siloed way um, in a way that's really hard to do as well the next critical success factor that really came through strongly in our research was around managing for impact and sort of once people are further down the line, this tends to be around how do you express your impact? How do you um, measure it and understand it? But when you're starting something, the most important thing about managing for impact is to cost in delivering the outcomes that you want to see in your community right from the start. So for example, if you have a core value around fair price to farmers, environmental impact, um, any of those kind of things, it really needs to be costed in right from the absolute start. Um, and so that's one of the other things to consider. So I'm just going to pause because I just heard from Sharon. Uh, there might be people in a waiting room. Let me check. Sorry, I will pause. Um, so I'll maybe while I'm just checking the um, back end of the, the webinar details, uh, if other people want to have a quick chat about, you can unmute and have a quick reflection on what we've heard so far in terms of some of those impact factors and whether they ring true for you. 
Yeah, I'm just, I'll, I'll heads it up, um, Jen, if you like, while you do that. I think the, the thing that I've seen, and, and um, I know Shelley, Shelley Bowen's in the room now, and uh, around that collaboration and the trusted, um, starting a collective or a cooperative is often a bit of a challenge around getting getting all all bits to align. Um, and and it, I think it's a, and I'll, Renata might be able to share this a little bit more about her experience when, well, either now or when we get to it. I think these things take time to build and often they might start small and then people start to work more together and see the opportunity and then come in. Would, would that be right, Renata, with, with what you saw with Strathbogie Local? Yeah, I mean, we jumped in very quickly. Um, we made our hub happen within two or three weeks um, and then it, it definitely grew over time after that. Yeah. And how did you manage to get it off the ground so quickly then? Uh, why we, COVID, COVID that, that, not? <laughs> <laughs> we just wanted to make it happen. Um, we're two people that um, we've done a lot of community events together, so we, we know how each other works. Um, and I'd say you'd probably call us goers. Yeah. We just, like, you know, if we, we can be a little bit dog at a bone. If we've got an idea, we just kind of figure out how to make it happen and make it happen. <laughs> Um, I can't see anyone waiting in the waiting room, Sharon. So yeah, it might just be gone, have gone to a wrong link or something like that. Yeah, there's a few, um, a few people couldn't get on to the link. What I might do is see if I can re-forward it to while you guys are getting on with it, those that aren't in the room. No worries. Um, so the next uh, critical success factor was understanding I guess the the different levers that people could pull for viability, and one thing that came through really strongly was um, that there was sort of almost like a finite number of ways that people were managing to make community food enterprises viable. Because I don't think that anyone would say that they are, you know, it is quite hard to make a community food enterprise balance the books. Um, people are really used to cheap food, which externalizes a lot of costs. It doesn't pay people fairly and it doesn't necessarily um, result in the best environmental outcomes. And so when you're trying to internalize all of those costs, it can make food more expensive or you need to find other ways to kind of defray some of those costs where it's, you know, potentially someone's paying for environmental services, um, rather than trying to recoup that entire cost from the sale of food. Um, so, you know, like carbon credits would be an example of that. Um, but the other kind of levers for viability were people needed to really found that a lot of success in looking for underutilized assets. And so that could be potentially community assets as well. Um, the Whittlesea Food Collective, just on the outskirts of Melbourne is a really fantastic example of that where they wanted to start a food hub and an urban farm or a peri-urban farm and they saw an opportunity to use Yarra Valley water land and Melbourne Polytechnic a sort of a shed and they just kind of kept asking they just kept saying these are community assets they're not in use at the moment can we use them and it was a really great way to unlock assets that were incredibly low cost to underpin a food hub, um, which I think is a really exciting way of doing it. Obviously, there's using IT, you know, we're using web services. So that's part of why the Open Food Network platform exists, is to try and help people um, work through uh, something that's quite lean and to kind of organise the back-end logistics of, of some elements of things so that they're not kind of spending all of their time, you know, running lots of reports and spreadsheets and phoning people individually and so on, which was what people tended to do when we first started designing the Open Food Network platform and one of the reasons that it got designed. Um, in terms of logistics, that's an area where really efficient design and shared infrastructure and shared logistics can make a difference. So I know certainly there's people on this call who've, you know, done sort of backloading with other enterprises um, where their loads coming into town and then you know some other food is coming back out to the region for example um, and then there's there's a few other sort of things like cross subsidization where you know perhaps you know series would be a great example where you know you've got education and you've got um, you've got food uh, as well and you know they're sort of cross subsidizing each other and finally, there's the big one is collaboration. So there's collaboration with, you know, a food literacy project between wholesale and retail, 
the really key one, shared infrastructure, shared logistics. And then some of the other ones around, um, you know, there are some really exciting new ways of people are doing collaboration. So for example, a sort of whole crop CSA model um, where uh, that's certainly in discussion at the moment with social enterprise procurement in Melbourne. So a, you know, a lot of food distribution that is funded at the moment, looking at agreeing to purchase a whole crop from a farm. Um, and then there are shared marketing groups, for example, you know, some of the things that Hepburn's been considering. And then there are the participatory guarantee systems where, you know, if you're trying to avoid really expensive certification and you're selling in a sort of hyper local way, you can do, you know, a type of certification where it's each of you visiting each other's farms and guaranteeing each other's systems and so on. Um, and that's a very simplified version of what that is, but that's, that's one of the options as well. And then there's just, I guess, looking for ways to streamline collaboration. So again, that's why we designed a platform, but it's only one example and there's so many others as well. I'm going to pass to Renata now to share a case study on what it was actually like to start a community food enterprise. Thanks. Uh, okay, so yeah, um, my name's Renata and um, along with a good mate, Cheryl, we set up Strasbourg Local basically over a couple of beers at the start of COVID. Um, we had spoken to a few growers from our local farmers market who were um, under a little bit of stress because they had lost their way to sell to customers. So traditionally had sold through farmers markets or to restaurants uh, and both of those were, were gone for the foreseeable future. Um, we've done a lot of work together as well. We both uh, live in Euroa. Uh, we're not farmers. I have an ag background. I've studied ag and work in the industry. Um, Cheryl has a trucking business um, and works in distribution. Um, so yeah, basically we wanted to support growers and give customers access to local, um, great local food that they love and, and were missing. So. so in terms of um, what I'll talk about today, um, I'm going to go through producers, the Open Food Network website, how we use it, um, management, stock, customers, uh, the money, key learnings and future direction. But firstly, just briefly, I'll explain what Strathbogie Local is. So Strathbogie Local is a food hub where um, we use the Open Food Network um, website um, and people can go on and purchase produce from a number of different producers uh, in one purchase. Um, and then we bring all of the produce together in one place in your rower um, and we box up your order and it's sitting there waiting for you on Friday afternoon when you turn up to um, pick up your order. So producers, we've currently got 18 producers. There's a couple um, waiting to come through. Um, uh, so yeah, we'll go up to 20 in the next couple of weeks, which is exciting. 11 of them are in the Strathbogie Shire um, and they're all within 120 kilometres. So the big question is how did we find them? To begin with, it was just about having a conversation with all of the producers that um, we'd been buying from for a long time and, and knew quite well. Um, and yeah, we just called them and asked them if they'd like to be involved. I don't think anyone actually said no. Um, so it was just then a conversation about how it would work and, and what we needed them to do in terms of um, delivering produce and, and what would work. Um, so I'll get to the nitty gritty of it um, in a little bit. Um, and then from there, we also reached out to other local growers that we knew about that weren't necessarily at our local farmer's market. Um, and we also had a look at the open food network of other producers local to um, Euroa and asked them if they'd like to be involved. Um, so we manage everything um, and then we take um, a percentage um, as a running cost. Co totally volunteer run, um, so we consider ourselves a community enterprise um, and we're not for profit in the sense that we're, we're not trying to make money, we just want to take a little bit to cover our costs uh, and potentially put some back into the future, um, into the community in the future. Mostly for us it's about making sure our producers actually are paid a fair price, which we believe they deserve. So for the website, um, so we use the Open Food Network website. Um, we have a hub and then each of the producers has their own kind of portal and they put on their produce. So that um, grid you can see in the middle, that's what I can see at the back end. Um, and so I can accept all of the different producers product into our shop. 
Um, and then the other um, screenshot is of our actual website. So when people go on, they can see all of the different product um, and that they, they can then purchase um, from there. Um, we manage order cycles um, and um, the, the producer manages their product. So some of our producers, they don't use um, the Open Food Network. It's maybe too hard for them or they don't have a computer. Um, so our guy, our baker, who makes beautiful bread, he only has nine loaves of bread. Um, he doesn't have any inventory because he just makes to order. So it means that we just have his nine loaves up there. I manage his shop in case he ever changes his bread loaves and um, he doesn't need to go on there. So there's a little bit of um, managing or massaging how, um, how each of our um, producers use the page. So in terms of management, um, I look after the website. Um, so all of that ordering stuff that you saw. Um, I do a, a newsletter through MailChimp, social media, um, and any producer website issues. Cheryl manages the producer orders, so she communicates with the producers. Um, any order issues, such as um, missing items, uh, and then the distribution site, side, which happens out of her um, trucking business, which you can see in those photos. Um, Andy sorts all of the orders on a Friday morning. He also does a collection on Thursday afternoon of some of our vegetables and mushrooms, which is great. And then in terms of distribution, we have different volunteers who come on a Friday afternoon and they'll put those orders into people's cars. Um, so yeah, that, those photos are each individual weeks of all of our orders. And you can see that they're all um, boxed up with um, the person's name on them, so ready to go. Um, so for stock, um, the producer um, can manage the inventory. So say you know, the lamb producer that we've got only has um, two legs of lamb. They can go in there and actually say that they've only got two available. So as soon as they're sold, they're sold and they're, they're, they're gone. Um, we then, so the producer will then put new product up or change their inventory and then we accept it all into our hub. Um, and then Delivery can be a little bit of an issue for some people, particularly if they've only got small amounts. Um, so like the pork producer will actually pick up the olive oil on the way through to Euroa um, so that he doesn't have to drive one bottle of balsamic vinegar across. Um, we have consignment stock as well. So honey, um, some beer um, and wine will all sit at Cheryl's um, yard and then they only have to deliver say once a month, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then we might only sell one jar of honey in a given week, um, but we can access the, that box and save them a trip into town, which is great. Uh, we use the Rotary Cool Room. At some point we'd like to purchase our own, but um, it allows us um, to have a portable cool room for all of our cool um, food. And we also take a percentage of all of the um, products sold instead of a handling fee. We initially, I think it was about an $8 handling fee to manage all of the orders, um, but it was cost prohibitive for, say, if you were just going to buy a loaf of bread um, and a bottle of oil. Um, so yeah, uh, then for customers, so our shop opens Thursday morning and runs through to Wednesday night and that seven day cycle is then um, available for collection on a Friday afternoon. They can buy anything in one transaction. Um, it's an online payment, so we never handle cash, which is something that was really important to us. Um, we then pay each of the producers um, after the orders have been supplied. They'll get a confirmation email um, to say when to collect. Um, and then it's a contactless collection on the Friday afternoon from 12 to four in Euroa. So they drive into the shed, we put the order in the boot of their car and then they drive away. Um, we also use Instagram and Facebook uh, for social media to promote. And we have a newsletter weekly that we use um, MailChimp and we find that to be really um, successful um, in terms of reminding people to make their um, purchase. So in terms of the dollars, um, we take 10% from the producer. Uh, we take 5% from the customer that they don't know about. So we just add 5% um, onto the producer's price, which is all inbuilt into Open Food Network. It's pretty easy for us to do. And then that commission will pay for things like um, our power, our insurance, the Open Food Network um, running costs, gifts that we um, give to our volunteers or to our producers or our best customers. Um, and also we'd like to save for a cool room one day. 
and potentially we'd like to put some of this money back into running community events when um, COVID restrictions as they ease. We'd like to do some stuff around food and um, understanding where our food comes from. And also maybe even be able to put some small grants back into our growers to help, help them with um, diversifying and growing. So then our key learnings, um, big one was probably take a small percentage instead of a fee. Um, newsletters are golden. Um, one example was last week we put a, um, a recipe for a, a broad bean salad and I think every second um, order that week was for um, broad beans, which is pretty cool. It's also a great reminder for um, to buy and we find that about, we get four or five orders um, within a couple of hours of our newsletter going out every week, which is great. Um, celebrate the wins. So, you know, we're a volunteer run um, group. So we want to remember that um, while we're doing it. So if we get a new customer or if we get a new producer, um, first time we hit 20 orders, first time we did more than $2,000 of revenue, really important for us to celebrate those little wins. Um, anyone can make a hub work. Um, we're just two um, community members that saw an opportunity um, and just kind of went with it. I think once you get the ball rolling, things just kind of will follow um, and you can kind of grow it. Um, we started with um, some really good mates, um, which was a good way to do it as well. Um, at, when I say good mates, um, they were our initial customers. Um, offer a good range, a bit of everything. You don't just want to have vegetables, you want to have some bread and some meat and um, yeah, as good a range as possible. Recognising purchasing patterns is really important um, as well and communicating well with other businesses within the town that we weren't there to try and um, take over or, or put them out of business, that we were just wanting to support other growers who are also local businesses. So finally um, is our next um, our future direction. Um, so Initially, we were starting because of COVID, but we're now here to stay. Um, we see an opportunity to be, we're, we're weekly, whereas the farmer's market is only monthly. Um, our, our council's also keen to provide some funding when they can find it um, to help pay for some of the time that it takes. Um, Cheryl and I probably put in about eight hours a week each. Um, so it's quite, it is, it takes a lot of time to get it going. Uh, we'd also like to see other collection points, so other towns. We've got quite a few people who are driving significant distances to get to pick up their order, which is a good sign that um, it's well supported. Uh, and the council is also looking to build a new visitor centre, so we'd like to see that as potential collection points so that it engages with, um, with tourists as they come through our town and potentially have a bit of stock on, on uh, available for sale as well. So. That's, uh, that's us and um, happy to answer any questions uh, at the end. Fantastic. Thanks, Renata. So we'll whiz through this next bit really quickly in the next five minutes so that we've got at least 15 at the end to chat. Um, yeah, so I, I won't cover everything that we had intended to, um, but just talking about well, what can you do in your region? Um, and so just sort of recapping that there were those five critical success factors. But one of the things that we've seen as the most effective way to start something in your region is just start as small as possible. So to sort of start with what you have, where you are, and undertake some lean experiments to understand your context. And when we talk about lean experiments, we use this a huge amount. It's kind of adapted from, you know, software engineer, um, production and and manufacturing as well but looking at lean experiments is a really it's a bit of a nerdy way to approach it but it's really effective at not sinking effort and cost into something that isn't going to do what you want it to do and so the way that we talk about it is these kind of key steps of like setting your goal understanding what those barriers are so you know the goal might be so say for Strathbogie, it might have been, um, you know, we want to see local produce for sale during COVID, understand the barriers, no one's selling it, explore solution options. Um, and then it's starting, this is the really important part is identify the assumptions. So, you know, an assumption might have been um, people aren't buying it because they don't know about it. We could just do an advertising campaign and then everyone would know that local food existed. Uh, and then, you know, imagine you sink, I don't know, $50,000 into an ad campaign, 
but that wasn't actually the thing holding people back from shopping. The thing holding them back from it was, you know, we want to pick something up midweek in our town. Um, and that's a really obvious example where it feels really like a common sense thing, like, duh, of course, I actually want the opportunity to buy the things. Um, but you'd be amazed how often, you know, someone would be like, oh, an education campaign will fix this. And it's like, oh, there's maybe actually just a purchasing barrier. And so then you design your experiment to test that assumption out. So figuring out, is it the case that, you know, an education campaign would make the difference or is there an experiment we can run to test out some of the other things that we think might be the barriers to this outcome that we want of local food purchasing happening? And then it's just about running the experiment, testing it, measuring and responding. So in terms of the testing assumptions, it's really around like, what do you believe about your customer and what they need? And what's the evidence that you have that supports that? And the thing you're looking for are those beliefs you have where you just kind of think it's a thing, but maybe there isn't any evidence. Are they just assumptions? And which of those assumptions are like big ringing bell? If you're wrong about that assumption, the whole project could be put at risk. And so when you articulate those assumptions, that's when you start to be able to test them. So say for example, you know, if there's a, a desire to set up a producer collective, it's like, what's the assumption that, you know, what are you assuming having a producer collective will achieve? And which of these assumptions, if you're wrong about them, could put the project at risk? And so then it goes through, you know, having a hypothesis that you can experiment against. And this one, this is one that I really like, where it's looking at, we believe that by doing this for these people, we will achieve this outcome. We will test these assumptions with this experiment and we'll know if this is valid with these outcomes and kind of taking that mindset into something in your local region can be really helpful to just also relieve a bit of the pressure. It's like, you don't have to get it perfect to start. You just kind of have to start somewhere and you kind of have to know why you're doing it and what success looks like. So I think it's really important to think about it as like the opportunities to learn, you don't have to build, you know, if you want to eventually have a, I don't know, like a local storefront that stocks everything from your region as a sort of a local supply supermarket or something like that. The best experiment to test that isn't necessarily building a tiny shop. It might be something like Strathbogie Local where it's, it's much more agile than that. Or it might be just, you know, a buying group with friends or something like that. Like you can sort of start to, design your experiments around the thing that you test that you really want to test. Um, so I won't go into too much more because I think it's really important to talk about where to from here for particularly for Hepburn. Um, and so I guess I'll open it up. We've got, I will mention, we've got all sorts of resources that I'll send through after this as well that can kind of help with some of these tools. And there is another webinar coming um, on Monday the 30th of November that Sharon's also hosting um, around collaborative logistics. So I'll share the link to that as well. But I think for now, it'd be really fascinating to open up the floor and ask some of these questions. And if you have any questions for Renata as well in this context. Well, maybe, um, can I throw to Kim, Kim Cook, I think it is from Tasmania, has had a question around um, liquor licensing. So Kim, are you happy to answer that, uh, ask that verbally rather than just in the chat? Yeah, so um, we've set up a very similar producers collective in Tasmania um, and we're just sort of looking at onboarding some wineries so our advice has been that we need to get our own liquor license but I just wanted to hear what your experience was. Yeah sure we have a liquor license um, we got one uh, it took us I think it took us a few weeks we just rang the liquor license board and asked them what we needed to do we explained what we were going to do they were amazing they just talked us through um, how that would look they were fairly under the pump because there were so many businesses that had never done takeaway that were trying to add takeaway um, alcohol to their takeaway food business so restaurants and the like uh, but they talked us through it was a pretty basic um, 
uh, thing that we needed. Um, but yeah, it just allows us to sell someone else's alcohol um, uh, as, yeah, so not for consumption on site for, for takeaway. Um, so yeah, we, I, I hope yeah. that answers the question. <laughs> yeah. did, did you need to have RSA certifications and people on site when people pick up? I have an RSA, so I'm the registered person on our liquor licenses as, as an RSA. Um, but beyond that, um, I, I'm not sure about, I can't remember whether we needed to have a, have me on site. I'm not always on site. So it, it's clearly not an issue or we haven't given it as much thought. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thank you. No worries. Thanks, Kim. Anybody else want to jump in and, and ask a question? Shelley? Yeah, I will. Um, oh, fantastic presentations. I just loved, I love all the passion and energy and you're giving me hope <laughs> because it kind of feels... Um, incredibly hard but I've just taken some powerful messages around you know that balance of scale and experimental and keeping lean but being prepared to scale up and all those things one thing I wanted to ask um and both of you Renata and Jen about is um value and how do you balance that kind of like I saw that what goes into those relationships to build your market but at the same time you know there's a big competition here against supermarkets, you know, and um, and the plastic kind of stuff. And so how have you gone around kind of really putting that value on your product and getting people to appreciate it? Have you seen a shift? And is it, you know, is it COVID enabled and boosted? And, you know, what's your experiences of where we're at around that as a community? Um, do you, I'll answer first. So we have a very distinct type of customer, which we've learned over time. Um, it's probably a reasonably well-heeled uh well-educated, affluent customer. Um, so they love knowing where their food comes from. Um, so mushrooms is a great example. So our mushrooms are produced um, 19 kilometres from Euroa. Um, the local supermarket sells mushrooms of a fairly comparable price, perhaps a little bit cheaper. Mm. They're grown in Sydney. They're then driven to Melbourne and then from a distribution centre driven back to Euroa. Um, so they're driven past Euroa. <laughs> Um, and our consumers love that they're buying uh, a really lovely mushroom that's probably fairly similar um, in taste, but they're buying it locally from someone that they yeah. know is a, a small producer. So they like the story. So I think there's a lot of buying from the story, um, which we communicate through our social media and our newsletters um, if you were going to a farmer's market, you would get that from, from the producer as you're purchasing mm. because they're not getting that. We make sure that we deliver it in a different way, which is newsletters and social media. Mm. Okay. Mm. I think there'd probably be some others on the call as well who'd have some input on that. I don't know if Kim or Tanya, you wanted to share your sort of thoughts on that as well around sort of communicating value and um, how you make those kind of, how you, how you find those customers, how you keep those customers, how you explain price and, you know, are you competing with supermarkets or are you just looking in a, swimming in a different pool? Um, one of our biggest issues is Tasmania is a very small place, but it's also very large. So um, at the moment we're struggling to get any veg Cons consistent veg producers, which is a major uh, uh, negative to people buying and shopping. So I think once we can secure that, w people won't need to go to the supermarket, especially those customers that have those similar values of food miles and local and fresh, etc. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's a really challenging thing is um, just sort of when, when you're trying to almost like maintain a market share of, of people with, uh, you know, trying to keep them purchasing from you, that hungry gap period that we're just sort of coming out of now in terms of veg is, is a really challenging part of that. Cause it, like Renata said, you need a kind of a full shopping basket of bread and eggs and, you know, veg and meat and dairy and that sort of stuff. Um, and I think that's where it's been really interesting to see some of the hubs that have used you know, it's like, it's that idea of like, once you build enough continuity of supply, you then start to have a kind of trust relationship with your eaters to take back out to growers to say, look, they're sitting here waiting. You know, if you can come to the party with, you know, X, Y, Z, veg, dairy, whatever, there is this audience here for you and sort of making that, 
I think that's where somewhere like probably Borbor um, have been really good at going out. And I know they run um, Become a Grower online events, for example, um, and they'll articulate like we've got gaps. We, we can't, you know, we're missing citrus or we're, you know, we're missing these types of veg or that sort of thing. So it's, I guess they kind of throw almost like do a, like a, a re, I don't know, like a sort of like request for interest kind of thing as well. Um, yeah, uh, Tanya's also asked a question around um, continuum of supply after original markets open. Um, and I, I feel like that ties in really well to this. Um, and, and just touching on the vegetables, we notice that weeks where vegetables are um, lower in numbers available, our orders drop off. Um, people want vegetables as part of it. They're, they're happy to buy some olive oil and bread, but they want vegetables to go with it. So if we don't have vegetables, we, we really struggle. Um, so the big thing is us, we, again, we just keep communicating. We say, this is a seasonal, like you are buying direct out of the ground um, and the, the, there's not much at the moment. They're, they're about to come into their summer um, produce and, and I think people love that story. Um, in terms of continuum of supply, um, once the, the market's open again, we've been discussing this with our producers. They're all keen to continue weekly. A lot of them are looking at actually potentially dropping some of their markets. Um, so some of them are going to a market every month and they're saying, well, we can now just drop back to our favourite one or two markets uh, because we're getting enough supply. Um, and they, they see that as a, a real win for the way that they um, sell, um, that they've got multiple streams. So they're not completely relying on a farmer's market, which, you know, they say when it rains a lot, um, they don't get as many people coming through the gates of a farmer's market um, and that affects their sales. Whereas the online farmer's market hub that we've got, doesn't matter whether it rains. Actually, Renata, I just, I want to add to that, that, that you know, including a lot of small producers who may go to farmers markets, if they're unwell for one weekend, you know, for whatever reason, they can lose thousands and thousands of dollars because they don't necessarily have a staff member who can go online or their, their farmers market for them. And I think out, what's come out of COVID-19 is, is that, that we can't rely always on that sort of farmers market footprint. It can be part of your distribution channel, but not solely. And I do agree that the online opportunity um, allows a brand awareness piece as well, because then everyone's seeing all different types of brands that come out of one region, rather than just seeing your shop. I think that your shop adds, the physical shop adds value to the online footprint. It used to be the other way around, but I think it's, it's the online actually is one of the uplifts now. I think it'll be really interesting though to see how things evolve over time as well because I think so many farmers, you know, like gathering customers, you know, there's a lot of farmers who've kind of spent years and years at farmers markets to build up a customer newsletter list in order to maybe just do direct sales or a CSA or something like that. But then there is also that sort of maintenance of relationships as well, which is, um, you know, I think, yeah, like so San Tanya's commented that social media works well for them and, and you know, Barham have just brilliant social media um, in terms of feeling really that connection to a farm as, as a customer. Um, but it's it's a real skill as well to sort of maintain that without the kind of face-to-face -face opportunities. So, yeah, I think it's always about knowing your strengths and knowing the trade-offs of each different type of sales outlet as well and which ones give you energy and which ones take and <laughs> all sorts. And uh, we've had a, quite a bit of feedback, especially from young parents, that taking kids to farmers markets is a bit of a nightmare. So they're loving the whole sort of click and collect concept and getting that great produce. I have a question about scale. We're finding that the producers in our area want a pretty reliable demand. And so it, we're trying to figure out, you know, how many customers do we have to have so that it's not feast or famine for a particular producer each week and maybe even putting in a, a required minimum buy each week if you're going to be a, a member how how do you handle that it's an interesting question jane um we haven't gone down that path um our orders are our orders 
I suppose our bakery um, is probably a good example. If he only gets an order for say um, 15 loaves of bread, he finds it really hard. He's, he fires up the oven and he's only got an order for one loaf of olive bread, one loaf of potato and rosemary and a couple sourdough, whatever. And what he'll tend to do is, because we've made it really clear we don't want to give money back. We don't have to refund money unless it's a problem with the product. Um, so he, if he only has one loaf of olive bread ordered, he'll make a loaf of sourdough and replace it. Um, so he won't bother to make a whole um, loaf of um just, just one loaf of olive bread. Um, so those kind of conversations are really important around how we manage it. So um, when the, someone orders a particular type of potato, um, say a Desiree potato um, and Somerset don't have that, they'll replace it with a Charlotte potato. So making sure that people still get um, product, even if it's a slight variation on what they actually ordered is really important. I know that that doesn't really answer your question, but that's one of the things that we've faced and, and how we've dealt with it. I'd just say also um, on the subscription piece, one of our, our veggie grower offers a $45 um, mixed box of veggies every week. Some people buy it, um, probably, oh, I don't know, not a high percentage. Most people just choose, pick and choose what they want. And I think as soon as you limit um, the option to a set amount, um, you will lose people. Um, we've got quite a number of people in our um, customers who are, they have limited resources and so they might only spend $30 per week, but that's, they're buying $30 of what's really important to them. And if we only offered a subscription option or minimum purchase, we would lose them completely. And we feel like it's really important to allow access to good produce to everyone, no matter what their means are. And I, I think that scale thing is also, it's so, yeah, it's so dependent on some of those other costs as well in terms of how much your infrastructure is costing you and, you know, all of those other, like what your kind of potential customer pool is. And I think that kind of logistics stuff is, is really a sticking point as well around scale where it's all about if you're actually, you know, are people coming to you? How far is produce coming to you? It's a lot of that sort of stuff around, yeah, the kind of the moving food around. So I think that next webinar as well that we have will be quite interesting on that front too. Um, I'd be interested to know if there's been any, um, if, if you've lost any customers um, because of that, uh, you know, the fact that you are swapping produce because, you know, if you, like, you know, between olive bread and sourdough bread, um, that example that Renata gave, like, um, if, if there has been any, or, or, if, or if you're able to circumvent that because you're really clear at the start. Uh, I'm sure there's better ways of handling it. Um, it's just the way that we've chosen to handle it. Um, we've got really great customers who understand um, why they're buying food through our hub and what our producers are kind of going through. So I'd say um, with, yeah, communication's also probably the really big thing. We make sure we call people if there's going to be something missing or if there's a delay sometimes. At the start, we couldn't get our tomatoes there on time. Um, so we would ring everyone and say, tomatoes aren't gonna be here at 3 p.m. and everyone would turn up a bit later. So um, really important to just communicate. Um, and yeah, Sally, I'm sure there's a better way of us managing those products that aren't available, but everyone seems pretty understanding um, as long as they get something. And we're very clear that if they are not happy with having it replaced, we will give them their money back. Um, but we just try to avoid it because um, it's just, it's another job. Um, and as volunteers, we're trying to protect our time as much as possible. <laughs> Can I, can I just jump in there? And I was just listening to around that supply chain management because that's essentially what you're talking. It's a biz, big business language down to a small scale. And I think it's a bit of a communication and capacity building piece where if you, as, as a, any local or collective grew, then you would understand what the customer buying pattern is and then you're able to filter it down to growers to talk about what a pipeline looks like. And I think that's... That's what we're all learning from this is the 
the conversation of what the customer needs, whereas it, the current footprint is everyone drive, walks into a supermarket and gets what they want when they want. They know that that's not sustainable either now, and it's also probably not environmentally sound. So where you can have that communication, I think, and it's that's what my role is. I see what a fantastic opportunity this Artisan Ag um, producers project is because we can start teasing out these barriers and say, well, we need to educate growers now on what does a supply chain look like? You know, what's their capacity? Because they can only grow so much on whatever their land is. So Jane, I don't know if this answers your question, but it's a it's around understanding both the, the, the whole loop or that supply chain management, what the producers need to produce or can, and then what does the customer want? And see if you can narrow the gap on those things. You'll never get it perfect, but yeah, that's, that's just my thoughts on that. It's around that um, uh, capacity building. The other one we've found, um, so uh, product will be put up, but because there's um, inventory levels, they've only got um, however many kilos of tomatoes to supply, um, and then the, the product gets sold out and people get upset. Um, we've had several times people get upset that there's no tomatoes available. We've got a, an amazing tomato producer. And we just say, well, it's just the same as going to a farmer's market. Once he's sold out of what he's brought in his van, he's sold out, like it's, it's gone. And so you need to get in there quickly and put your order in on a Sunday instead of leaving it until Wednesday night. And they're like, oh, okay. And all of a sudden we start seeing more orders on a Sunday night. Oh, well, and that might be when you grow and end up having two tomato producers. You don't want to cannibalize each other. And that's the, 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 the challenge with this as it grows. But you want to grow, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's an organically growing business as well for you to say, well, now this tomato producer can only produce this much. Do we find another supplier now? And who's the supplier of choice? Um, because that's the other thing that needs to happen in a decision tree is, is what supplier at the moment, no doubt it's, it's whoever wants to come. You don't have to vet anyone particularly whether they, you no doubt they're preferred organic and those kind of things, but you don't necessarily rate suppliers. I think quietly we do. We, we love the people who turn up on time, that meet their orders and never have mistakes. We like people who send us emails with content for us to use for social media. Like there's little things as a producer that you can do to support your hub <laughs> and it'll, uh, it'll get you brownie points. So I'm, I'm just conscious of time. Is there any other questions we've got from the floor from any? anyone killer I think it's been a really as I said we had we had a registered 30 odd but we've only got about half of that but that can happen on a nice bright sunny day in Victoria Jane I know it's almost probably eight o'clock where you are in Colorado but it's uh it's nice and sunny over here in Australia at the moment um so any any questions from the floor to either Jen or uh, Renata before we wind up Oh, and you're on mute. <laughs> I love that tricky. She's oh, she's got a question here. Tanya, Renata, have you had any inquiries for potential growers that might be inspired uh, by Strathbogie Local? Um, not that I'm aware of, uh, but we've we've definitely had growers that inquiries from potential growers. Uh, well, we've got a couple that are excited to come on board. So one is a florist, um, a local florist who are looking to buy flowers from a local farmer who's starting out. Um, so she's waiting for her um, flowers to become available and then they'll, they're going to make um, flowers that, um, so we'll do a, like a $30 bunch every week. Um, so yeah, I guess they were a little bit inspired. Haven't thought of it. <laughs> and then, and that's a fantastic piece of, piece of information that it can extend further than just food that suddenly now you're talking beverages as well and they can they don't have to be alcoholic beverages they can be other types of beverages and then flowers too so the people who want a bunch of flowers in their house every week they're not getting them from you know uh, again a supermarket I shouldn't we're not caning supermarkets I'm not anti-supermarket completely here um, but I think that conversation of where they can buy local and and take out that whole that margin then goes back to the farmer more. And that's, that's the real key point here, that farmers are financially sustainable. Um, and that I think we're all very passionate about. 
So I think don't think there's any other questions in the chat. No, everyone seems to be very happy. Everyone's saying it's a great session. So thanks, Renata and and Jen. That's added added uh, to this conversation. So any yeah. other questions? And you want to just wrap up, Jen, at all? Or yeah, I'll okay. just let people know. So I'll send out an email. Um, I'll pop this recording up on YouTube and um, send through the sort of the links to um, our resources page and the report that we referred to with the sort of some of those like five success factors. Um, uh, some links to, I'll send a link through to Strathbogie Local and also to um, the Tasmanian Producer Collective, which is where Kim is um, from, because they're doing some really wonderful things. There was, I had to choose between inviting either either Kim or Renata to come and talk at this. So I'm actually quite delighted that Kim showed up um, as uh, and, uh, to also share their experience. Um, and yeah, just flagging again that Monday the 30th of November, my colleague Serenity Hill will be talking about collaborative logistics um, because that's just such a pain point for a lot of producers. Um, and there's some really fascinating kind of developments at the moment around collaborative logistics, potential opportunities for a pilot project that's just starting up. Um, so Serenity will be sharing all of those details. Yeah. And thanks, thanks, Jen. And thanks everyone for coming. And, and um, Hepburn Shire Council is really keen on working on how we can um, make this collaborative approach with, with producers more of a, a sustainable way and I, what I can see Strathbogie local of we're, we're gonna we're gonna pinch you Renata are you sure you don't want to move to Dalesford or something <laughs> somewhere you don't have to go as far as Dalesford within an hour we can probably pinch you to come and help us uh, prize open and, and start a, a great opportunity so thank you Renata thank you Jen and um, we'll see you all in a few weeks on the 30th thank you thanks everyone thank